the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I welcome you here this morning to this time of worship and praise, a time that God has provided for us to gather together to encourage one another and urge one another on, to join together in remembering who we are as children of God and how it is that we can claim that identity, to remember what God has done for us, proving the reality of his power and his might and his love. One of the ways that we're going to do that, to specifically remember and live into the truth about God's power and might and love, is by praying for one another in, uh, in a few moments. Um, but at this time, I would like to, uh, I have a couple of announcements to make and then invite you to share any prayer concerns or praises that, that you have that we can be joining together in prayer over the next couple of weeks. Uh, first of all, coming up on the 10th is our congregational meeting that will be here on Tuesday, November 10th um, at 7 o'clock. So we're going to be in prayer for that. Um, we uh, give thank, uh, prayers and thanks for the work that got done on Friday. There were six men from the, the church here that went up to the Keystone area and helped four different, did you guys go to the four, four different, uh, different uh, homesteads clean up after the derecho? Um, I only, only know the story of two. One, uh, the first place that we went to is owned by three sisters, one of whom is a, a who is a missionary in Cameroon involved in translating the Bible over there. Uh, the third place that we went um, is owned by a 90-year-old widow who is living on her her husband's home place. Um, we were cleaned up a lot of trees there that uh, her husband remembered watering when he was a child. So, um, I only know those. Do, do you know anything else about the other two, John? The last one was a middle-aged farmer that's still trying to harvest. We worked on cleaning up his windbreak. Yeah. There's still a lot of work to be done, and the, the work is significant. One of the, the, the men that we uh, that organized our day told us uh, about a middle, he was, he was in his mid-40s, and he was farming his family land, and he didn't have crop insurance, uh, and he lost everything, um, including, the guy thought, including the family farm and the uh, young man took his life a few weeks back. So, uh, you know, you think derecho when, you know, it's, it's not in the news anymore, it kind of gets off your radar. There's still a lot of pain that way. And so uh, we give thanks, you know, thank, first of thanks for the work that we were able to do, but also continue to pray for the people up there who are harvesting and who are still trying to put their lives back together. Um, and then uh, a few days back, uh, Linda Benjamin was at a, a doctor's appointment in Des Moines. Um, she fell and had bruised up her, her face and would, is asking for prayers uh, for her recovery as well. Um, and then not a prayer concern, but just information. The table talk is coming. Uh, something has gotten haywire in the shipping details, but it will as soon as, well, we'll get it out as soon as, as soon as it arrives. Are there any other prayers of, or prayer requests or prayers of praises that we can join together in lifting up over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, Pam. She's asking for prayers on Thursday. She goes in for a brief. 
procedure to diagnose why she's having abdominal pain has had it for the last couple of weeks. Last you know, month, time slips by, last month. Um, so praying for wisdom and answers and that the, the results that she gets will show nothing serious. diagnosed with liver disease, uh, asking for prayers for, for that. Will they begin treatment for that, or is that something that you don't? Yes. Yeah. Tom. Can we give praise to the Navy SEALs rescued the missionary in Adair, Phil Walton? Um, well, I didn't know him. I certainly knew his mom's dad. Um, we, we knew that. We knew the family from the chair. So we uh, give that prayers of thanksgiving and praise for the rescue of Philip Walton, a missionary in Niger. Um, the SEALs rescued him yesterday, I believe it was, right? Uh, for, uh, on our time, anyway. Oh, yeah, we are. Pray for our nation with the election coming, uh, for peace, a peaceful transition, whether it be a transition to what is or a transition to a new administration. Pray for calm heads. Uh, the way, according to what you hear in the media, it seems like uh, there is a no, we're in kind of a no-win situation that based upon who wins that election, the opposing, the supporters of the opposing party will riot or rise up in, in anger. Um, we can pray that the media is not right, and this is just a mistake, and that peace will come to our land. Donna. Cal Vandervoort, for whom we've been praying for a month and a half, or I think two months now. Again, don't, who, for whom we've been praying, is in, because he was diagnosed with uh, cancer, uh, in pancreatic cancer. Uh, is, he is now in the Comfort House. Um, I talked to Rich, his, his, one of his brothers, and Rich said that he, he was able to get out on the combine for a bit this fall, this harvest, and was able to drive the semi a little bit, but he is now in the comfort house. Very, very sudden turn. Pray for him and his family. Please pray for our community, our state, and our nation, uh, and our children. Asks for prayers for our community, our state, nation, with the ongoing battle against uh, COVID. Uh, that things are, are going up again. I know that's going to cause some frustration and anxiety, and uh, depending on what is ne necessitated in order to, to combat it and keep people safe, uh, it will take wisdom and understanding and compassion. Two counties yesterday that they made mandatory in Iowa for masks with more than 10 percent. Are there are there any other 
Yeah, that's it. It just keeps going. It just keeps going on. There's one thing that faced the unknown as we were entering into spring and summer. For me, emotionally, that's a that's a great time. Spring and summer. I find facing the unknown going into winter a different situation altogether. So we need prayer for that we get this thing settled so people are stay well and connected well in all different definitions of that word. Given that uh, the things that we have just mentioned regarding are specifically regarding prayer requests, requests for for help, requests for peace, requests for wisdom to face the unknown and deal with uh, really a disease that seems to be um, really a strange kind of thing. I find what Paul writes in Philippians 4 to be of really unique value. I mean, it always is, but given the time that we're in, what Paul writes here, and this is what will what I will use as our call to worship. Paul writes, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the, to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Out, and just really kind of audacious claim that Paul makes them. Everything that we tend to value in this world, in comparison with the value of knowing Christ, is rubbish. The value of knowing Christ and being found in Him outweighs everything else. That's what Paul is saying to us today. And as we begin to worship, I would encourage you to hear what Paul is saying and ask yourself, why would I, if you would, why would I ever claim the same thing? What is it that makes Christ valuable to me? Of what value is Christ to me? Of what value is knowing Christ to me? And what makes that valuable? We're going to sing three songs to, to start our worship. One is knowing you. The first is knowing you. The second is the joy of the Lord is my strength. And the third is that's why we praise him. And as we're singing these songs, May allow the Spirit, through the words that we sing, to open your eyes to the value of Christ, to the value of knowing Him. Who knows? It may be a word that we that, that the Spirit triggers, and all of a sudden your heart is taken into a different place. It may be a word that we that you hear, and all of a sudden your mind is enlightened by the power of the Spirit, so you see Christ as new. Paul says, the value of Christ is more than everything else combined. As we begin worship today, I invite you to stand ready in your heart by joining me in a word of prayer. Father, your word is, is full of testimonies to the, the value of your Son. Your word is full of witness and
messages that say essentially the same thing that Paul said. That knowing Christ is more important than, more valuable than anything else in our lives. This morning as we begin to worship you and as we begin to praise, as we sing together the, the words that were inspired by you, penned by another person, I pray that your spirit will trigger in our hearts and our minds a, a similar kind of passion for Christ that lived in Paul, so that we can say truthfully that we know why Christ is so valuable. We know why knowing him is so valuable, that we see him and his beauty with such clarity that nothing can compare. Father, to that, meet us here. Work in us, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So why is it that you say, along with Paul, there is nothing that compares to the value of knowing Christ? What did the Spirit raise up in you, inspire in you, remind you of about what it is that makes Christ be known or knowing him and being found in him so incredibly valuable. I sensed there were memories or there that things were coming as we were worshiping and as we were praising that the passion for Christ expressed by the singing of this congregation grew. Why is Christ valuable to you? It's a very good thing to remember this day. And as we move into uh, another uncertain week and weeks to follow, I would say that there is no time, there has been no time in my life that remembering that and focusing on that has been more valuable. One of the things that makes Christ <coughs> precious to us is the way or the way that he opened the door for us to live in a dynamic relationship with our God. A relationship that allows us to come to him now in a word of prayer giving thanks for the ways that we have seen him at work within us, uh, 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 an expression, uh, an action by which we do more than thanks, but we, we live into the full joy that comes with knowing that God is involved in our lives, that Christ is involved in our lives. Uh, I, I like the way that C.S. Lewis put it uh, in talking about sharing uh, beautiful and joyful things with others, he said that that's, that's a completion of the experience. And in the same way, expressing our gratitude to God for what he is doing is a, an, as a completion of the joy of seeing that. And then Christ also opens the door so that we can bring our concerns to our, our Father, trusting him for our future. With that in mind, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come today. We've heard Paul say that there is nothing more valuable than knowing who Jesus is and being found in him. As we've sung, your spirit has reminded us of why that is true and has helped us understand what it is that makes Jesus so valuable. One of those things is because he has taken us who were far off members of different folds and have sheep folds and has drawn us near to you. As Paul writes to the Ephesians, reminding us of who we once were, we were those who were separated from you, far off from hope, but Christ has drawn us near. The nearness allows us to call you Father, for which we give thanks. The nearness allows us to know you as Father, for which we sing our praises. The nearness allows us to express to you our gratitude for the ways that we have seen you at work in our lives. 
on Friday, going up and knowing, trusting that through the labor of six men from this church, other people were encouraged, were reminded of where our hope undying lies, were drawn hopefully closer to you. We also give you thanks that through our government and through the military branch and even more specifically through a team of Navy SEALs, you rescued one of your missionaries, Philip Walton, from his kidnappers. And he's safe again, either headed back to or even now with his family. In amazing and world-shaking ways and in simple and individual life-transforming ways, you are at work in this world, shining through your people. Father, we give you thanks for that. But we also look ahead to the next week and to what has happened and there are things that weigh heavy on our hearts. There are people in, from this church for, that, are, that are facing health issues. Linda and Angie and Mary and Calvin who is a member of this community. All are walking through a time of physical existence that they would, that they don't desire. Linda Bell and Angie facing a procedure on Thursday and Mary having received a diagnosis of liver disease and Calvin who is in the comfort house. The reality of our, of our existence is that we are physical as well as spiritual beings. And our physical quality of life impacts our spiritual quality of life. And so in addition to praying for healing and for direction and for wisdom and for comfort, we pray, Lord, that you will sustain each of these and others we know who are battling an illness of some kind. That you will sustain them with your word and with your presence. That you will show them the reality of what David talked about in Psalm 23. That you will be with them where no one else can. And you will sustain them and their hope, and you will keep them in your love, and they will know that there is never a place where they will go where you are not present. In a, to a greater degree, or a larger degree, Father, we recognize that this next week will be a big one for our nation. As we come together to vote, to express our desires for who will be our leader. First, Lord, that we, we pray that your will will be done. That your will will be done and that your people, the people of this country, will accept the outcome when it's known. Lord, for some reason or other, right now we are living in a time where anger seems to be the common, most our most common characteristic. Fear, second to that. Peace 
absent. Today we pray that by your hand that will be reversed. And peace will come to this land. And anger and fear and hatred will be driven away. Father, we recognize that, that all of us here and all of us in this country have played a role in making things the way they are now. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways that we have rebelled against you in a way that has set the, the anger and hatred and dis-ease free to roam over our country. Forgive us and restore us and restore this land in keeping with the, the promise that you spoke through Solomon that when we, your people, humble ourselves and pray, seeking forgiveness admitting our culpability, resting on your grace that you will heal our land. Father, this will be a week or maybe a couple of weeks in which the future of our country in the immediate will be determined. Sustain us and keep us and, by, and if it be your will, change the nature of our country. And if it not be your will, Father, then keep your people strong. Help us see clearly the value of knowing Christ and in seeing, endow us with wisdom to live based on that valuation. Come, Heavenly Father, hear our prayers this day as we lift them to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, as we ready our hearts to receive God's word, I would invite you to join me in singing our hymn of response, Worthy of Worship. <laughs>
enjoy now is the way that God reveals his worthiness to us by means of and through the gift of his word. The title for this message is Three Displays of Jesus. Um, I amended that, and it is now three, actually one display of Jesus, because uh, three was too many. Uh, we would be here for a long time, um, unpacking the way that Jesus reveals himself to us in John's Gospel. As I said, as we but as, as John made clear a couple of weeks back, Jesus came into the world, comes into our lives, enabling us to see, fully, really see, in a way that we can't without him. Last week, Jesus spoke and through John's Gospel. Well, John wrote, clarifying who Jesus was and who Jesus is, helping us see that Jesus opens our eyes to who God is. Today, we are going to listen to one way that Jesus tells us who He is. A lot of different people throughout history and in our own day want to tell us about Jesus and who Jesus is and who Jesus was and if or if he was or was not. But as I understand it, when it comes to defining who we are, there is only one person who has the right to tell us, and that is Jesus. It is only Jesus who has the right to tell us who he is. He does that in a number of ways uh, throughout the God, John's Gospel, the I Am, the seven I Am statements, and we are, is, the, is one of those that we're going to, to look at here together this morning. As we do so, would you, first of all, join me in a word of prayer. Open our eyes. Open our eyes, Heavenly Father. Open our eyes, eternal everlasting, only begotten Son. Open our eyes and help us see the light of life. Help us see the beauty of that light to see that as desirable. Open our eyes this morning wider as in as is the case for some and perhaps for the first time for others help us see father this we pray in jesus name amen from john 8 verse 12 when jesus spoke again to the people he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Again, not three displays of Jesus, actually one display of Jesus. It goes back to understand and to appreciate and to grasp for ourselves what Jesus is saying here in John 8, 12. We have to take a step back a few thousand years from that moment. Because what God did for his people in Egypt and as they moved from slavery to the promised land, is in the immediate background of what Jesus says. Life had changed for the people of God. As you may know, they had lived in slavery for 400 years. 
But all of that changed because of what God did for them. He sent them free. Free to go from the land of slavery to the land that God promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had left their houses, they had left the land, and they were on the edge of the wilderness. And they were faced with the question, how do we move from here to there? How do we make our way through this wilderness? It wasn't an easy thing that lay in front of them. The wilderness posed all kinds of threats, some of them known, some of them unknown. And as they looked out, Moses, at least, if not everybody else, was saying, how do, how, how do we get through that? The answer to the question of how to, cross that, how to cross that wilderness was found in God himself. Having set them free from slavery, he now went with them through the wilderness, never leaving them, but guiding them by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And now we jump ahead a couple thousand years to where Jesus stands in Jerusalem. The Israelites were celebrating God's act of providence his act of guiding them through the wilderness and providing them as they went through the wilderness in the celebration that was called Sukkot, or that has been translated the Festival of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Each year, they would come together in this time of celebration. It was a seven-day celebration. centered, again, as I said, on all the ways that God provided for them. But on the last night of this seven-day celebration, focusing in on the amazing gift of light that God had guided them by. They celebrated that amazing gift, its precious nature. They, they celebrated the wonder of God's continuing presence with them through the wilderness. The fact that God did not set them free and just say, hey, I'm sorry. Just give me a second here. They celebrate the fact that God did not just set them free from the land of slavery and then expected them to figure life out from that point on, but he went with them through the wilderness and they celebrated the way that God led them to the promised land. The ways, one of the, the most significant ways they did that was by setting four large bowls of oil on pillars that would be lit along with many smaller lights and that night would be given over to singing and dancing, praising God for the gift of light, its precious nature, and his proof of his presence and its power to bring them to the place they really belonged. It was said that when those lights were lit, the whole city of Jerusalem was lit up by that light and by the sounds of celebration inspired by remembering what God had that's the background for the, this Jesus display that we are looking at today. It was on the seventh day, on the seventh day of Sukkot, while the lights were blazing and the people were focused on God's goodness in providing direction through the wilderness, that Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
In that seemingly simple statement, Jesus tapped into all of the symbolism of the Exodus that was on display to show his people who he is. He says, in essence, look and see, open your eyes. Do you see that huge lantern up there on the pole? The one that reminds you of how precious light is for life? Especially when you are going through a dangerous and uncertain place. The light that shows you how good God is to you, to give you the gift of life. Do you see it? And Jesus says, that's who I am. That's me. I am the light. I am the precious gift of the light of life. He says, look, open your eyes. Do you see that huge lantern up there on the pole? The one that reminds you of the way that God didn't leave you in the wilderness? The one that reminds you of his grace and the depth of his mercy and love by the fact that he didn't leave you just to figure it out on your own? That's me, he says. Open your eyes. That's who I am. I am the never leaving light of God with you. He says, open your eyes. Look up. Do you see that huge lantern up there on the pole? The one that reminds you of the way that God led you through the wilderness to the promised land? That's me. That's who I am. I am the one who will guide you through the wilderness of life and bring you to God's kingdom, the place where you will be welcomed, the place where you belong. Life in this world is a wilderness journey. But I will guide you through it all so, so that during the times that are dangerous, when darkness in its many shades is strongest, you will never be without illumination. My light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not, will not, can not do what? Overcome it. I am the light that shines in the darkness, even in the darkness of the shadow of death. And the darkness will not put it out. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6 to 10, Paul, I think, reflecting on this promise of Christ, writes to his friends in Corinth, helping them understand how significant the light of Christ is for us. He writes, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our, our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. God has lit our, our hearts up with the light of knowledge of Christ. With that very thing that Paul says is so much more valuable than the totality of every other gift God gives us. And then he writes, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And then he writes, and here's where it gets really important. 
where are the life of Christ and the significance of significant impact that the life living in us has. He writes, we are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be shown in our body. Jesus spoke on Sukkot, I am the light. In your darkness, in the darkest of times in your life, my light will not be put out. Those are the claims that Jesus made about himself. That's what he wanted people to see and know about who he is. One aspect is not the totality. There are other I am statements in John's gospel, and I encourage you to take a look at them. Uh, we, there was our focus of our, uh, of our um, Lenten season a couple of years ago, but it's just good to remind yourself again. But apart from Jesus saying that, here in verse 12, he also gave an, an invitation to the people who were listening to him back then and to those who have the opportunity to hear him since then. And what he says next, those who follow me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, the light of life. Jesus made it clear that his life is given, but not to everyone. To whom is Jesus' light given? What is the qualified? The light is given to those who follow him. In other words, it is given to those who believe that he is, who believe that he is who he says he is, and who, as a result of believing those two things, do what Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says so perfectly. After describing in chapter 11, the approach to life that is common to all heroes of faith and all people of faith, chapter 12 begins like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and do what? Run the race that is set before us with perseverance, looking to, to Jesus, looking to Jesus, looking at how he lived, emulating him, listening to him, following his way of life. Those who follow, those who believe that Jesus is, that believe Jesus is who he says he is, and because of those two beliefs, look to him as we make our way through this wilderness of life, those are the ones to whom Jesus says, you will have light. To those who look to Jesus when things aren't going their way, Jesus says, you will be led by light. To those who look to Jesus when things are going their way, to them Jesus says, you will be led by light. To those who look to Jesus when they are facing an uncertain future, Jesus says, you will be led by light. To those who look to Jesus when facing a future that is seemingly certain, to those, Jesus says, you will be led by light. You get the point, right? Those who look to Jesus, no matter what they're going through, and no matter what's going on around them, believing that he is and he is who he says he is, those are the ones who receive the light of life. So what does it mean to look to Jesus? I think that's a pretty important question. And I think 
is defined, this is a, a really helpful rule of thumb. If you have a question raised by one passage in Scripture, look in, throughout the rest of the Bible so that Scripture interprets Scripture or you find your answer to the question in the Word of God. And I look to Psalm 1, the beginning of Psalm 1, as a, a beautiful place where looking to Jesus is defined. Psalm 1, in Psalm 1 we read, or we hear God say, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of scoffers, mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Looking to Jesus means first, not looking to those who deny Christ for advice on how to live or understand what's going on. Looking to Christ, looking to Jesus means not copying the lifestyles of those who are rebelling against God's ways and against God's will. Looking to Jesus means not trying to fit in with or be part of a group that rejects God and laughs at the idea of in short, looking to Jesus involves first choosing well and with great intention the ones who shape our approach to an understanding of life. Who I am and who I am becoming and what's happening in the world around me. Who are you listening to, in other words? When, when, you, when you're making your way through the wilderness, how, who are you listening to about where you're supposed to go and how you're supposed to get there? About the, what you're going to lay aside or throw off, what you're going to keep and what you're going to treasure. Choose well. Choose well to whom you give the privilege of speaking into your heart. Now, this doesn't mean that those who follow Jesus don't have anything to do with the wicked, the sinners, or the mockers, that we separate from and look down on those who fall into those categories. That is completely anathema to the gospel. Rather, it means that the group we choose to belong to, our homies, if you will, I don't know if that's hip language these days, are those who believe in and confess Jesus, who embrace God's way and God's will, and who submit to God and celebrate his goodness, glory, righteousness, and love. That's where looking to Jesus begins. There is a second part to the way that Psalm 1 defines what it means to follow Jesus. It's described in the last couple, it involves delighting in God's law and meditating on day and night. One of the accusations that the wicked and the sinners and the scoffers make against following Jesus is the claim that doing so means that we doom ourselves to living a fun-free life. They say that those of you who follow Christ and look to Jesus are doomed to a life of boredom. Or as Billy Joel will say, sinners have much more fun. Let me say, nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> nothing! Nothing at all! Scripture is full of people who love life. Who are having fun in the days that God gives them. Who are experiencing delight. Joy, full, complete joy runs all throughout the pages. The thing is, it is a different kind of fun and delight and joy than what we can have by means of the world's offerings. Having tasted both. The delights this world offers and the delights that God gives 
I say to you, the delights of God are infinitely preferable. Being convinced that God, and the reason I say that, the reason I want to make this point is because being convinced that God-given delights are better than those offered by the world is where following Jesus begins. We will not choose to follow Jesus. We will not look to Jesus if we are not convinced in our heart of hearts that he is more desirable than the things this world has to offer. In, in fact, until we are convinced that what Paul says to the Philippians is true, that there is nothing that compares to the value of knowing Christ. There is nothing that compares to the desirability of knowing Christ. We will not pursue looking to Jesus. Until we are convinced of this, we will not follow. We will not walk. We will not turn to the light. Why? Because we are, at the very core of our being, by God's design, joy-seeking creatures. And until we see in Christ the source of all joy, true, awesome, life-affirming joy, we will not seek. The search for God's delights, the life lived by following Jesus, which I think are synonyms of one another, then involves, according to Psalm 1, meditating on God's Word. This is how our hearts are shaped, how our tastes are altered, how we acquire the taste for God's given delights and follow Jesus. Let me, let me ask, how many of you like to drink coffee? How many of you remember your first taste of coffee? How many of you can say, that first taste was like, wow, I love this stuff. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I am what is commonly known today as a coffee snob. I like coffee, but I, I did not when I first began drinking it. Coffee is an acquired taste, right? That's what we call it. The, the, the delights of God are often an acquired taste. How do we acquire that taste? By meditating on the Word of God. It's by making use of the Word God has given us that we are taught about who we are and about who God is. It is by reading it, but reading it in a unique way, in a meditative way, the way I understand what this means is this. A meditative reading of God's word begins with believing, first of all, that Jesus is alive and understanding that following him at its core is a relational thing. Jesus is alive and to follow him means I'm in a relationship with him. Just like I am in a relationship with him. Sorry, I've got it. I'm afraid I've got kidney stones working through my back. Uh, the following him is a relational thing. With that belief and understanding, reading meditatively is seen as the way that an ongoing conversation with, you, with Jesus begins every day. We are all in and all enjoy relationships of one kind or another. What is one of the main keys to a healthy relationship? It begins with a C. Communication. If you don't communicate with someone, you cannot say that you have a relationship with him or her. It's the same with Christ. Our living Lord invites us into constant conversation with him. And the way that that conversation begins often is through the meditative reading of his word, where we read a passage, 
And that begins a conversation that goes through the rest of the day. I look to the heavens, or the, if the heavens declare the glory of God, example. Read that one, that, that one line, the heavens declare the glory of God, and just that one sentence, that one statement, begins a day-long conversation with our Creator. All around me. I see your glory on display. Oh Lord, man, thank you for thank you for making that. Thank you for giving us the sunshine this day. Lord, I, I'm, I'm just kind of lost right now. I don't really understand or see that glory. Can you open my eyes? Do you, you see what I'm talking about? Day-long conversation triggered by uh, the reading of God's word. In a way that, not in a way that we read it and say, okay, I got my 15 minutes done, I'm on to other things, but in a way that this sentence that I have read today, I am going to carry through with me for the rest of this day. That's the meditative reading of God's Word. And by that kind of reading, God shapes us so that the, the delight that He gives. That we are we acquire that delight, and based on that, we look to Jesus with more intensity and with more intentionality, and we follow with greater fidelity the way that He walked through this life and the way that He would have us walk through this life. And as we do so, the light of life that He came into this world bearing shines in us and shines through us and shines ahead of us so that we know how precious the light of God is, so that we know that we are not alone, so that we know and believe that this light that is shining will guide us home so that at the end of our lives we will be welcomed into the kingdom where we belong and we will be welcomed to that place that Christ has gone ahead of us to prepare for us. And then Psalm 1 says, those who live that delight in that relationship with Christ, we are like trees planted beside living water. Great big oak trees that are never going to be swept away. Not because we're strong, but because the light, the light of life dwells in us. And the darkness can't overcome that. I am the light of life, Jesus says. Look to me. Follow me. And you will have my light. Let us pray. Father, the darkness seems to be powerful at times. At other times, the darkness seems to be alluring. Either by, because of fear or by temptation, we are led to not see the reality of your life. Jesus speaks to us today, inviting us to follow, inviting us to turn to him, inviting us to see. And as we come to the end of this service together, Lord, I pray that your spirit that has been given to each of us who believe in the name of our Lord, that, that spirit will open our hearts to receive the light of life that shines in Christ so that we will be found in him and known as his. Father, come, send us your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And now I would invite you to join me in singing our closing hymn, More About Jesus.
What is it that Christ, what is it that makes Christ valuable to you? Is it the fact that he has shown in your life and shown you a way out of darkness? Is it because he has drawn you into a family of faith? Is it because he has promised you that you belong and will belong for all eternity to his family? Is it because he provides for you every day? Is it all of that and more? Yes. Our Lord, our Savior, the light of life, provides everything we need. We celebrate that here and now by returning to him a portion of that which he has given to us. We celebrate that now by expressing our gratitude in a word of prayer. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift of life and for all things necessary for it. Thank you for the gift of new life in you and all things necessary for that. Shine ahead of us. Shine around us. Shine through us. And as you do so, Father, help us see and embrace the light of life that will lead us into our eternal home. Father, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, this week, above all else, I think it is appropriate for me to close out with this benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his presence upon you and fill you with his peace. Amen.